Our God is on His throne ruling the affairs of men. God does not change. His truths have not changed. He's promised a witness in the church according to the election of grace in all ages that will stand for the old paths, defending His truth. The Primitive Baptist Digital Library is pleased to present the Word of Sovereign Grace. Timely video messages based on the King James Bible and the doctrines taught by Christ and the Apostles. First, we're all thankful to the Lord to have this opportunity to meet together in the house of God. And that is something that I did not say lightly and do not take I hope you do not take it lightly. I hope that we're very thankful for it. It's a privilege that it's very easy to be taken away from all of us. We appreciate the humble prayer that Brother Bowman has offered. We appreciate him especially asking that the Lord would grant grace, mercy, and peace to us as we try to speak to you tonight. Because you'll notice as you go through the New Testament that we find that there are several letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to churches. And his normal greeting to the churches is grace and peace unto you. But we find in the New Testament there's three letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to ministers. He wrote first and second Timothy and also the book of Titus to young ministers in the gospel. And his address to them is not grace and peace, but his address to them is grace, mercy, and peace. Because if there's ever been a set of men on earth that need mercy from the Lord and also need mercy from you people, it's men who have to stand up here and try to preach the Word of God. It's the greatest burden and heaviest responsibility I have ever had in life. It is the very easiest thing to sit there in the pews and to pick and criticize, to sleep and yawn and pick fault. It's a far more difficult thing to stand before God's people and to try to preach the Word of God. I've said many, many times that every member of the Primitive Baptist Church and certainly every preacher's wife ought to be forced to have to get up here and try to do this one time. Uh, then you might understand why the Apostle Paul says to preachers that they not only need grace and peace, but they need grace, mercy, and peace. And as we look on this particular day, April the 15th, we recognize that this is the day that many American citizens fear. There are people all over this country that dread this day because it's the day of reckoning where we have a deadline to turn in our income tax for the federal government. And in the previous days and previous weeks, there have been many people concerned about filling in every line that's required, filling in the proper line, and uh, going through these very complicated income tax forms that the government requires, especially if you're self-employed. And they have many lines, so you've got to put the right information on the right line. And then also you've got to have the proper forms. And there are many people who at the very last minute uh, have to rush back and get a brand new 1040V, which is something new this, this year. Maybe you have to rush and get a Schedule F because you're a farmer, or a Schedule C because you're self-employed, or a SE because you draw Social Security. And we find that... Uh, right on up to midnight tonight, there will be folks rushing here, rushing there, trying to get the postmark on before the deadline. Thought went through my mind a few minutes ago, I would to God that the American people had as much fear of the Lord as to do the IRS. <laughs> because I also find in the Bible where God has given us things, he says, line upon line and precept upon precept. I wish that uh, all of the American people were as concerned about every line of God's requirements and uh, meeting the line and doing what God says, if only we had as much fear of God as we do the IRS, why wouldn't it be a wonderful place in which to live? I certainly appreciate Elder Bowman's prayer. I appreciate the old hymn, Amazing Grace, and the line in it, that the, this world shall soon dissolve like snow. I like the way it was originally written. I like that. Uh, somebody in recent years has taken the liberty to change that, that the world shall soon to ruin go, but Bible readers are very well aware that this world is ruined already. It's been ruined ever since Adam fell. Uh, however, one of these days it will dissolve. It uh, is not a world that someday soon shall to ruin go. It's ruined already. It's been ruined now for thousands of years. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, we read of a time when the very elements, the very atoms of which this world is made will be dissolved. It will dissolve like snow. And as far as I'm concerned, the sooner the better. Amen. Now we stand before you tonight with the responsibility of preaching the Word of God and to uh, relieve the burden of my mind. I try to pray to the Lord to point us to some particular area of the Scriptures. And if 
I follow the impression in my mind I not only want to preach to you about the most important subject of the Bible, but also the most needed thing among God's people. The most needed thing among God's people today is not to hear sermon after sermon on practical godliness or personal holiness or to hear a series of 75 dead dry sermons on repentance or such as that or for God's people to be bull whipped with uh, duty, practical godliness and things of that nature. But the greatest need that God's people have today is to hear Christ preached. And any time God's people meet together, a minister of the gospel is never wasting time if you're up in this pulpit honoring Christ. And I say to any minister in this congregation or any minister who will ever hear these tapes, if the time comes that it's your responsibility to preach and you have nothing on your mind and you feel totally empty, then get up in the pulpit, magnify God, and honor Christ to the very best of your ability, and your time will not be wasted. My wife's dad lived to be past 99. He was a spiritual giant among the primitive Baptists, the best deacon I've ever known. My mother-in-law is still living, but she's been faithful to the old Baptist. I think about them. I, th I think about many other people that were outstanding members of the church that stayed faithful to the church through thick and thin. They endured seasons when there was really no preaching going on in their churches. I'm talking about dry seasons when God had withdrawn the Spirit. They also had other seasons, of course, of rejoicing. They went through the winter and the summer in the church of uh, the Lord's church. They endured all kinds of things. They were faithful. They brought their families up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And they did not do this because somebody stood over them every Sunday bull whipping them on practical godliness, personal holiness, and preaching a long dry series on how people ought to repent for this or that or the other. Uh, they were faithful primitive Baptists, and I could talk about hundreds of other people. I could talk about thousands of other people. I could talk about people in these mountains, in this section of the country, that I knew and you knew who were born in the be of the Lord. They were faithful, outstanding primitive Baptists for one reason. That is, they loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have enough love for Christ, uh, many other things will fall in place. Uh, for a preacher to stand before his congregation Sunday after Sunday and tell people how they need to attend the, the services, uh, how they need to do their duty and uh, be here and do things like that, uh, that will take care of itself if the people you're preaching to love the Lord enough. You'll be here if you love the Lord enough. Uh, you'll stay faithful through thick and thin if you love the Lord enough. And if it's the Lord's will, I want to turn to one of the most Christ-honoring statements that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. We find in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that the Apostle Paul closes that chapter out with this statement. He says, without controversy, great is the mystery of Godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, that he was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Now that statement is very easy to say. But that statement contains spiritual mysteries that it would require a man over a week to try to preach out or try to even touch. He mentions about seven characteristics there of the work and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, there's more material here than a man could preach out in an entire week's meeting. But Lord willing, I'm going to try to do an overview of what he said here in that one verse. I'll try to just touch some of the high spots. If it's the Lord's will, the Lord will open it up. You'll pray for me and we can have your spiritual attention and support. The Apostle Paul in making this sweeping statement says, and without controversy. But I want to notice that there's many things that he goes on to say that the religious world that surrounds us has made controversies out of these things. I have a friend that uh, is president of a college, one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever known, and a man who knows much of the truth and works harder preaching around the truth than I do preaching it. And a person that I never expect will ever become a primitive Baptist unless the Lord really works him over because written too many books, he's gone too high out in the world. But the person I'm talking about knows a great deal of the truth. He was invited one time to a big city denominational church to come in there and preach a meeting to them. And the big city pastor of that church, and of course you understand this is not a primitive Baptist church, but the big city pastor of this famous church instructed this man before he got there he said, I do not want you preaching on any controversial subjects. The man I'm talking about, the first night he went there, preached on the virgin birth. 
Uh, when he got through preaching, the pastor called him aside and he said, I told you when you came up here not to preach on any controversial subject. Well, you see, the subject of the virgin birth is considered a controversial subject in the denominational world. I have surveys at home where uh, <coughs> teachers and seminaries over this country, and I, I have these articles in my files. I could stand before you and name the schools I'm talking about, and some of them are in North Carolina. I could name the divinity schools, I could name the professors, I could name their denominations, where university professors, uh, uh, seminary professors across this country were asked the question in this survey, do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Do you believe in the divinity of Christ? Do you believe in his virgin birth? Close to 80% of them said they did not. There are multitudes of men who stand in denominational pulpits and back when I was younger and a fire-breathing dragon in the pulpit, I probably would have named some of them. But now that I'm a middle-aged grandfather, obviously overflowing with the milk of human kindness, I will not. But close to 75 to 80% of them replied that they did not. I have at home copies of Time magazine where the subject of the virgin birth of Christ, the divinity of Christ, has been thrashed out back and forth. And it is a controversial subject in the world. I thank God that it is, it is not, I repeat, it is not a controversial subject among primitive Baptists, and I pray that it never will be. But do you realize that the Apostle Paul, first thing, over 1,900 years ago, speaks of something that's without controversy? Now, the world may make a controversy out of it, but he says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He said, there's no controversy about this. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The question we might ask is, what is this mystery of godliness that he's talking about? Is the mystery the issue of whether or not there is a God? Is that the mystery? No, the existence of God, the question of whether or not there is a God, is not a mystery. Because according to the teachings of the Bible, God has given us so much evidence out here in nature. That nature itself declares that there's a God, and in fact, a person who looks at the evidence out here in nature and denies the existence of God is nothing but a fool. I come to Psalms 14, 1, Psalms 53, 1. David says twice in the Bible that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I've said this to God's people a thousand times, but I hope to keep on continuing. I hope to live to say it at least 10,000 more. Because there's youngsters in this congregation never heard this before. Those of you who've heard it probably have forgotten it. But when you look at those verses of Scripture, the Apostle Paul says that that fool's trouble is not head trouble. That fool's trouble is heart trouble. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know what's wrong with him? Uh, he has the wrong kind of a heart. His heart is fixed on, wrong, on the wrong thing. Now, I might go to that individual with some information. I might go to him with the Bible. Uh, I might try to educate him. But you see, his problem is not the lack of education. If his, uh, if his problem was the lack of education or lack of information, then you could go to him with education and go to him with information and <clears throat> perhaps convince him. But you'll never convince a person like this because their problem is not head trouble. Their problem is heart trouble. And the only ones who can change the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls is the God of glory himself. And he tells us that he did that for us by in the 36th chapter of Ezekiel, verses 26 through 28, when he says, I will put a new spirit within you, a new heart also I will give you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. He says here, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And some of you young people may be enrolled in colleges roundabout, may be telling me right now, well, I have a professor at school who says there is no God. Well, you've got a professor who's a fool. That's all there is to it. And you might say, well, he's a doctor. Well, all that means is he's Dr. Fool. I'm oh, sorry, he's still Dr. Fool. I've said to God's people hundreds of times that education minus regeneration still equals damnation. I mean, go write that one on the backboard, uh, write it on the blackboard. Education minus regeneration still equals damnation. He says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. The mystery here is not whether or not God exists. We come to Romans chapter 1 verse 20 and the apostle Paul says the invisible things of him, that is the invisible things of God. All of these invisible things of God that I cannot see, all these questions about God that I cannot answer, he says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood 
uh, about the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. That simply says that if we will study the things that God has made, if you'll study everything from an anthill, which, by the way, is one of the most complicated societies you ever thought about studying. I mean, all you've got to do is spend <clears throat> just a few minutes with an encyclopedia, and you start reading about the civilization and the order and the government that takes place in an anthill or in a beehive. <clears throat> when you start reading about the officers and their functions and the things that take place down here in the anthill, down here in the beehive, when you start studying those things, when you get through, you're going to have to say that that gives glory to God. On the other hand, when I study the star of heavens, when I study the universe that's above me, I have to say the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show up his handiwork. He says the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. He says even his eternal power and Godhead so that they're without excuse. But he says, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, said God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, <clears throat> did the Apostle Paul say that the idea of there being a God is unreasonable? That the idea of there being a God, uh, that uh, it lacks proof? No, he didn't say that. He said, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. The idea of there being a God out there who runs this gets in the way of their lifestyle. It gets in the way they want to live, a way in the in the way of the <clears throat> a life that they want to live. Uh, verse 22, Romans chapter 1 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You see what they are? They're wise professors, uh, but they're fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. As I began to ponder some of these things I have tried to set before you, the mystery that the Apostle Paul is talking about is not the question of whether or not there is a God. Because he says that that's clear. It's very clear that God is and God runs things. But when we read the statement, he says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Here's the mystery. Uh, the mystery, I say for the 34th time, <clears throat> is not does God exist? Is there a God out there? That's not the mystery. That's plain. Yes, sir. That, that's very plain. But here's the mystery. The mystery is the teaching that about 2,000 years ago that the eternal God of glory humiliated himself, that he condescended and came down to this earth and was conceived of a Jewish virgin, uh, <clears throat> conceived of the Holy Ghost in the womb of a Jewish virgin. That's the mystery. That is the mystery. Without controversy, <clears throat> great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Most all of these modern and revised Bibles will attack that verse. They'll try to change it somewhere or the other. Some of them try to take out the word God and substitute He. Uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of God and this He who was manifest in the flesh. You see what they're trying to do here? They're trying to take away from the Bible teaching that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Uh, <clears throat> what they want to impress on you is that Jesus is a good moral man. He's a philosopher. His teachings are good. But they want to deny what the Bible says, that Jesus is nothing less than God manifested in the flesh. Uh, and I think we all understand that this word manifested means brought out to light. It means uh, something that's revealed where we could see it. He says, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. He says there's a time about 2,000 years ago that God was manifest in the flesh. He said there's no need to make a controversy about it. Isn't it, isn't it strange that this modern world has labeled it a controversial subject? Uh, real strange, isn't it? Uh, when the Bible says that it's without controversy. There was a time, and I spoke on some of these things this morning, but I want to go back over them, uh, some of them this, uh, tonight. And I thank the Lord for the two outstanding services we've had already, but that could only be possible through the uh, uh, Spirit of God. And I pray that the Spirit of God will be with us once again. But we find in the Old Testament, about 800 years before Christ was born at Bethlehem, that God made a promise to Israel through the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and I want to say again, this was close to 800 years before it happened. He says, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. It says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. And we all know that means God with us. He says, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. In 1952, when this flood of revised Bibles came out, 
I vividly remember that some of these translators had taken the liberty of taking that old Hebrew word Alma and substituting young woman. The Lord himself shall give you a sign, a young woman shall conceive and shall bear a son. I ask you tonight, what kind of a sign is that? What kind of a sign is it for a young woman to conceive and bear a son? It's no sign at all. It's been taking place from the foundation of the world. Uh, it, uh, my daughter-in-law bore a son last October the 6th. There are babies in this congregation right now. I've heard of others who are on the way. Young women have been bearing sons since the foundation of the world. What kind of a sign is it for a young woman to conceive and to bear a son? It's no sign whatsoever. <clears throat> but it is a sign when a virgin that has never known a man conceives and brings forth a son. That is a sign from the Lord. Now we come to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 22 and 23. And he says, The Lord hath formed a new thing in the earth, that a woman shall compass a man. Well, for a woman to compass a man-child is really no new thing. Again, it's been going on ever since Eve brought Abel and Cain into the world. It was going on when I was conceived in my mother's body. There was a time when I was encompassed in my mother's body. There have been billions of men on earth that have been compassed at one time in their mother's bodies. But my friends, it is a new thing in the earth when a virgin that's never known a man compasses a man and brings a child into the world. Now there comes a time in the first chapter of Luke where there was a Jewish virgin named Mary. The angel Gabriel appears to this Jewish virgin and you understand that she was a spouse to a man named Joseph. The Jewish virgin, uh, is, uh, uh, the angel Gabriel appears to the virgin Mary and tells her, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and thou shalt bring forth a son, and says he shall be the son of the highest. He will sit upon the throne of his father David, and said of his kingdom there shall be no end. She asks a question, and I've said time and time again, I said it this morning, and I hope to live to say it 10,000 times more. She asked a question, and in this question she asks, she outsmarted the theology professors. She outsmarted the Bible correctors. She outsmarted the Hebrew and Greek and Latin scholars of this day. And I want you to take this home tonight and sleep on it. I never saw this in my life until last week. But there was a time when the Lord Jesus Christ was being crucified that Pontius Pilate instructed them to write in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin that this is Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. They wrote it in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And the Bible says they put it above him. Do you recognize that this world today still puts Hebrew, Greek, and Latin above what Christ said? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Out here in the denomination world, if you want to get a job and draw a high salary for preaching, uh, they're going to want to know how much Greek have you studied, uh, how much Hebrew have you studied, how much Latin have you studied. And if you tell these folks, I haven't studied any Hebrew, I haven't studied any Greek, and I haven't studied any Latin, they won't give you the job. <laughs> And it is a crying shame. I told the folks this morning, very few of you that are here tonight were here this morning, uh, but now I've got an opportunity to say it to even more people. <laughs> and trying to keep a preacher quiet is like trying to slip sunshine past a rooster, except especially when the crowd is big. So may I say it to you one more time. I told the congregation this morning, I have compassion against drunks. I have certain compassion for people who mess their lives up through drinking. I have compassion toward people who've made mistakes in life. I have compassion toward people who have run and messed up their lives. I feel sorry for people like that, and I'll cut them a little bit of slack. In fact, I'll cut them a lot of slack. I have lots of compassion on ignorance. Being rather ignorant myself, Will Rogers said we're all ignorant except on different subjects. I have compassion on honest mistakes because I make lots of them. But there's one area in which I have practically no compassion. It's one of the flaws in my personality, and I hope you'll pray for me. I have absolutely no compassion for a primitive Baptist preacher that gets up here that thinks he's smarter than the Word of God and starts correcting what the Word of God says with Greek and Hebrew and his scholarship. I don't have any time for that. I'm, thank you, thank you. Hang me on, I'll preach. All right, pray. <laughs> As I told you a while ago, I've been around a lot of drunks in my life. I've had drunks in my family. Been around lots of them. I have patience with some uh, with that. I have patience with lots of things in life. In fact, some of my friends think I have too much patience. I've had patience with the uh, people that were going off track here, going off track there. I've gone the last mile of the way with a lot of folks. 
But I have absolutely no patience with a man that gets up here in the pulpit and says the King James Bible says, but that's an error, the uh, better manuscripts say. Uh, the King James Bible says, but a better translation is, the King James Bible says, but that's an error, the Greek says, the Hebrew says. I haven't got any compassion for that. I have no patience with it. Perhaps I should have. And if you think I should have, then pray for me. As I've said a thousand times, I need the prayer, you need the practice. Uh, <coughs> pray for me. I don't have any compassion. I have no compassion for people in this world who want to do like Pontius Pilate and put Hebrew, Greek, and Latin above Christ. He put him above him. Uh, <clears throat> my friends, you better take your Hebrew and your Greek and your Latin and your education and your scholarship and your commentaries and your knowledge and put it beneath the feet of Jesus Christ. I think I'll leave him that one myself. Uh, I'm concerned now about what the Lord says. I want what the, the Lord says. Now then, we come here to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel appears to this Jewish virgin. And he says to her, that you, you shall bear, thou shalt bear a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He'll be the son of the highest. And when she's told this, she asked a question. And in this question she asked, she outsmarted the Hebrew and the Greek scholars of this day. She outsmarted these Bible correctors. Because these Bible correctors want to go through the Bible, and every time the Bible says he was born of a virgin, they want to put in their young woman. Well, I've studied a bit of Hebrew myself. I've studied a bit of Greek, and I've studied a bit of Latin. I've wasted as much time in life as most folks. I've wasted a little time myself. I happen to know that that Hebrew word Alma can mean a young woman. Uh, I happen to know that this Greek word, Parthenos or Parthenon, that it means a virgin. But what's this? They want to substitute young woman. But listen to what she says. When the angel tells her that thou shalt conceive and you're going to bear a son, and he'll be the son of the highest, he'll sit on the throne of his father David, and of the uh, thr uh, <coughs> throne of his kingdom, there'll be no end to his kingdom. She says, how shall these things be, seeing I know not a man? You see what she did with that question? She put her own definition on her condition. Well, certainly she is a young woman. But she is a special kind of young woman. She had never known a man. Uh, that ought to prove to any sensible per a person that she's a virgin, just like the Bible says. Uh, what's the Bible definition of a virgin? How should these things be, seeing I know not a man? Now notice the answer the Lord gave. And I'll pose the question to the congregation this morning, and I'll pose it to you tonight. Who is it, <clears throat> if more information is needed, who deserves these, this information most? Number one, here's the little Jewish girl that is going to conceive him by the Holy Ghost. She will carry him through a normal human gestation period. She will deliver him into the world. She will wrap him in swaddling clothes. She will do all the things for him as a baby and through childhood that a mother must do for a child. She's got all this to do. Now, if more information is needed, does she deserve more information more than some overweight, fat, armchair, college professor of theology? <clears throat> Who needs to know more about it? I mean, this is her job. She's the one that has to do all this. If we need more information, who needs it more? <clears throat> does she need the information or does Dr. Smellfungus need it? <clears throat> I'll make the question a little closer. Does she need the information or do you need it? <laughs> who deserves to know the most? <clears throat> or who deserves to know more? Who deserves it? Now what's it? The question is, how should these things be, seeing I know not a man? Uh, the first person on, on earth to ever question the virgin birth. And seminary professors and preachers questioned today, but the first one ever questioned it was the virgin Mary. She says, how should these things be, seeing I know not a man? Listen to the answer from the angel. It says, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He did not say he will become the Son of God. He'll be called the Son of God. <clears throat> he was and has been the Son of God in all eternity. But you see, the text I'm dealing with today says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. <clears throat> it didn't say God came to existence in the flesh. Let's look at that word manifest. Whenever you find that word revealed in the Bible, you find the word, uh, we'll, let's take up the New Testament. <clears throat> Anytime you find that word revelation in the Bible, revelation, revealing, usually comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. See, I've wasted a little time myself. 
That means an unveiling. I'll demonstrate here. I put my watch down there. That watch is covered with that cloth. Let's suppose I walked in here and I found it that way. Or better yet, let's just suppose this table when I walked in here had a sheet over it. <clears throat> now somebody walks up here and they pull that sheet back. You know what they're doing? They're unveiling, they're revealing what's on the table. Uh, all right, <clears throat> I watch this. I remove the handkerchief. I have just revealed that the watch was there. Any sensible person knows that did not put the watch there. That's right. <clears throat> the word revelation or reveal means an unveiling. You unveil or reveal something that's already there. <clears throat> that word manifest carries a, sim a similar meaning. When something is manifested, it comes to light. Uh, but it's something that already exists. You see this? Uh, he didn't say that uh, God began in the flesh. He didn't say that uh, God came into existence. He didn't say that. He said, without controversy, great is the mystery of Godliness, that, that God was manifest in the flesh. That is, he's revealed. And when he was revealed that way, men began to call him the Son of God. Uh, it didn't say he, uh, that holy thing that's born of thee shall become the Son of God. It says shall be called the Son of God. They called him that and still call him that today. I'm thankful there's people in this world still calling that today. And the, the, here's the question she asked. How shall these things be, seeing I know not a man? Listen to the angel's answer. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God, period. <coughs> That satisfied her. <clears throat> you know, it ought to satisfy you. <clears throat> it satisfies me. <clears throat> she didn't ask any more questions after that. And if any more information is needed, she needed more than you do, or more than I do, or more than anybody else does. She didn't ask any more questions. So my position is <clears throat> that preachers and nobody else needs to be asking any more questions. She didn't ask any more questions. She took what the angel said, and the angel was God's mouthpiece. She just took what the Lord revealed about it and went on. You know, we need to do that about a lot of things in the Bible. Let's just take what the Lord said about it and went on. I go on. <clears throat> about the time my daughter was born, and I wouldn't tell you when that was, but she might get these tapes. But uh, about, the, about the time my daughter was born, I read a book put out by a preacher, not a primitive Baptist, but this man who knew a lot of the truth, godly man. I expect to meet him in heaven. Uh, but this preacher spent, started his life out as a medical doctor. In early life, he was a medical doctor. And then later went into the ministry and re preached and wrote lots of things that are the truth and lots of things I can rejoice in. But many long years ago, this man came out with a book called The Chemistry of the Blood. In that book, he tried to medically explain, medically, just how the virgin birth might have taken place. Well, when I read that book years ago, I was quite a bit younger than I am now. At first, I you know, was tempted to be impressed with it. And I don't say this sarcastically. I've met a number of primitive Baptist preachers over the years that were very impressed with this book. But you know, the longer I read this book, the thought kept going through my mind, tickling my brain like a feather. <clears throat> this, uh, this man is saying a lot more about this than the angel ever did. <clears throat> you know, he's trying to do a lot more explaining than the angel ever did. Uh, be better if I just took what the angel said and just went on with it, so I'm going to go on with it. He said, <clears throat> without controversy, God was manifest in the flesh. And I want to move off of that. That's one of the greatest facts that's ever presented in the Bible, that there was a time that the eternal God of glory who filled immensity yes, reduced himself and became so, so, so small that the Holy Spirit reduced him to a, to a human life cell. And it was planted in the womb of a Jewish virgin. And that is described by King David in the 139th Psalm. When he says, Thou hast possessed my reins, Psalms 139, verse 13, Thou hast possessed my reins, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. This is not David talking about himself. This is David spiritually speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and the virgin's conceptions. Thou hast possessed my reins, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. He said, I will praise thee. I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secretly, secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. 
Now, if you'll read the 139th Psalm, the Bible will tell you that the lowest parts of the earth is the virgin's womb. Now we come to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. The Apostle Paul says, Now that he is, uh, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity, captivity, he gave gifts unto men. And he says, Now that he ascended, he says, What is it? But that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He did not descend into the lower parts of the earth when he was buried in Joseph's new tomb. Because if you'll think about it, a tomb that's carved out of a rock on the surface of the earth is not the lowest parts of the earth. He did not descend into, into the lowest parts of the earth when he was buried in Joseph's new tomb. He did not descend into the lowest parts of the earth at some point after that. He descended into the lowest parts of the earth when he left the portals of glory and was reduced by the Holy Spirit into a human life cell and fertilized the virgin's womb. That's exactly what King David says in Psalms 139, verses 13 through 16. He says, Thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. The context of those lowest parts of the earth is the virgin's womb. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. And I've got a temptation to spend the rest of my time on that clause and not even touch the rest of it. But there's quite a bit of this I've tried to speak on this morning, but I want to move on to the rest of it. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. He says here that the Lord Jesus Christ, who left the portals of glory and was manifest in the flesh, when he was conceived of the virgin and born of the virgin of Bethlehem, he says there was another time when he was justified in the spirit. Now we might ask the question, what in the world does the apostle Paul mean when he says Jesus, the son of God, was justified in the spirit? The uh, best thing I know to help on that is, is get it out of your minds that that word justified means to make just. Usually in the Bible, that word just means to declare to be just. Now get this, <clears throat> to declare to be just. Justification in the Bible is a legal or forensic term. Justification in the Bible usually takes on the legal meaning. Many long years ago, I paid a lot of money for a Black's Law Dictionary. Every lawyer on, in the United States of America has one. And I have used it a lot over the years because many times the meaning of a word in the Bible is the legal meaning. And lots of times the legal meaning is not given in a common ordinary dictionary. Now watch it. You'll probably find the meaning I'm given in the dictionary you have at home. Uh, that word justify can carry the meaning of to make just, but that word justify usually carries the meaning of to declare to be just. Now let's consider this. We, we will consider a perfectly innocent person. This innocent person is accused of many crimes. This innocent person is taken to court. <clears throat> the case is tried in court. And the jury comes out and says, we pronounce this person not guilty. <clears throat> Did they make that person innocent? Think about it a minute. Did they make that person innocent? No, they didn't. <clears throat> that person was innocent. <clears throat> that person was innocent all the time they were being charged. That person was innocent all during that trial. All that jury did, they declared that person to be innocent. You see that? And some folks will ask the question. I've had this question asked me many times over a 40-some-odd year span. They say, well, if Christ died for the sins of his people and Christ has already paid the price for our sins, then why is there going to be a general judgment? And yes, there will be. It's in our Articles of Faith that we believe in a general resurrection and we believe in a general judgment and somebody who denies the general judgment is not only denying our articles of faith, you're denying your credentials, preacher, but you're also denying the Bible. <clears throat> there will be a general resurrection and there will be a general judgment. And you might be asking a question, well, <clears throat> if God put our names in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, if Christ paid the price for our sins, <clears throat> then why is it that there will be a general judgment. This judgment I'm talking about is not an investigative judgment. The design of it is not to, in, it's not an investigative judgment. 
the purpose of this judgment is that God, the great judge of the universe, because of what Christ did for you, uh, he will look only at the blood of Christ. Yes, oh, yes, sir. that's right. Yes, sir. That's right. Well, you say, well, I joined the church. I was baptized. I, you know, I paid my tithes. I've done this. I've, uh, I've been a good boy. I've kept all the commandments. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't chew. I don't have anything to do with them that do. I've been a good person. The Lord won't look at a bit of that. <laughs> you ought to do that anyway. Now, you ought to be doing that anyway. <clears throat> That's not the basis of your eternal salvation. In Exodus chapter 12, God told, the children, uh, told, his, uh, told Moses, that when he sent that plague of death over the land of Egypt, he said uh, that there was to be a provision made for his own people. He told Moses beforehand to take the blood of a spotless lamb and that the people of Israel were to apply that blood on the doorpost of their houses on the right and on the left and overhead. And if you're using your imaginations and you take a doorpost, you have blood applied to the right and blood to the left and blood overhead, that's in the former shape of a cross. On the right, left, and overhead. Did you notice that none of that blood was put on the door sill? <laughs> you know why? Because the blood of Christ is not something to be looked down on. <clears throat> it's not something to be trampled on. And God <clears throat> said that when the plague of death came upon the land of Egypt, and someone may be asking right now, well, why didn't those Egyptians go get some of that blood and put it on the doorpost of their houses? Because to start with, <clears throat> the Egyptians were not told to apply that blood to their houses. And in the second place, no blood was provided for the Egyptians. <clears throat> that ought to teach any sensible person that the death of Christ on the cross was a special atonement for his people. It was a special atonement for the family of God. Now, then, the, Lord, the Lord tells Moses, he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over thee. And there's coming another day when the judgment and wrath of God will be poured out upon this wicked world on which I'm standing right now. Yes. And I find in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, that there's a redeemed multitude in heaven, and here's their theme song. And their theme song is not water baptism. Their theme song is not church membership. Their theme song is not, and you ought to be baptized. You ought to join the church, do your duty. Uh, we, those are things we ought to do. Their theme song is not good works. Their theme song is not talking in tongues. Their theme song is the blood of Christ. Yes, sir. It says, For thou art worthy, for thou hast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. The theme song is the blood. <laughs> and my friends, in that day of the general judgment, God looks at nothing but the blood of Christ. You have the wicked over here, according to Revelation chapter 20. The wicked are judged out of the books, plural. They're judged out of the books according to their works. But you find over here that God's people are judged out of the book, the Lamb's book of life, according to what Christ has done for them. And there is coming a time when God's people are coming to judgment. But the purpose of this judgment is not to investigate but it is to exonerate. And before the entire universe, God will justify his people. The righteous judge of this universe will declare it not guilty. And it will reign through the halls of eternity. The purpose of this justification is to declare something. You understand that? A person who's telling the truth goes in and you're strapped to a lie detector test. And you pass the test. That didn't make you truthful. That person was telling the truth beforehand. <clears throat> they were telling the truth all along. <clears throat> all that machine did, it declared that they were telling the truth. That's all it did, just declared it. And I will turn that around. <clears throat> you could have another individual that's guilty of sin. And they can hire the finest lawyers on this earth. They could hire medical experts. They could hire all kinds of experts. <clears throat> you could even stack a jury and that jury can declare that wicked guilty person not guilty and it doesn't change a thing. Guilt remains. You catch it? <clears throat> because, <clears throat> because all that court does, that court does not make you guilty. If they say guilty, that doesn't make you guilty. It declares it. 
Uh, and if they say not guilty, that doesn't make you not guilty. It just declares it. Now, let's look at this expression. And for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh, that he was justified in the spirit. This expression here, justified in the spirit, talks about times where God declared, God declared that Jesus is the Son of God. And the first one that comes to my mind will be found in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. At 30 years of age, Jesus goes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. When he's baptized by John the Baptist, it says he straightway came up out of the water. And it says he saw the heavens opened. And he said he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And <clears throat> here's the declaration that came from the Spirit of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. Yes. Here is <clears throat> one more time where Jesus was justified in the Spirit. The Spirit declared him to be. You see that? Uh, Jesus Christ says, he says, I'm the Son of God. He says, before Abraham was, I was. He says in John 3, 13, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Uh, Philip tells him, asks him in John chapter 14, says, Lord, show us the Father. He says, Philip, have I not been with you so long? Said he that has seen me has seen the Father. He says, I and my Father are one. You recognize these are tremendous claims. If I made claims like that, I'd be guilty of blasphemy. If I went before people and says, He that has seen me has seen the Father, I and my Father are one, I came down from heaven. If I made claims like that, it'd be blasphemy. Those are serious claims to make. <clears throat> and I say in all the reverential fear, my heart can put together. Jesus Christ is either everything he claimed to be, or he's the biggest liar to ever walked this earth. <clears throat> the very idea of men saying he's a good moral teacher, his teachings are true, but he's not the son of God. He's a good philosopher, he's a good moral teacher. I've asked people time and time again, if you had somebody in your neighborhood that was going around all the time exaggerating, telling big golly whopper lies, would you call somebody like that a good moral man? I would not. Now let's listen to some of the things this good moral man said. This good moral man says, I and my father are one. <clears throat> this good moral man says, before Abraham was, I am. Yes, this good moral man says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. <clears throat> Those are great big claims if they're not true. But the Spirit of God justified him in those claims. Yes, the Spirit of God says, <clears throat> this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. This was God speaking through the Spirit. I also find on the mount for the transfiguration in the 17th chapter of Matthew, also recorded in Mark 9. And if you're real energetic, might as well read Luke 9 along with it. And those three, those three gospel writers tell of a time when Jesus went upon the mountain and he was transfigured before his disciples. His face began to shine as the sun, his raiment as the light. And the Father spoke from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Here's one more time. He's justified in the Spirit. I also find another time, and there's many of them, and I don't have time to get into all of them. I find there was a time when wicked men had nailed him to a cross. His disciples had scattered and fled. And you can only prove by the Bible that there, there, that there was one of those apostles at the foot of the cross, and that was John. The others were scattered and fled. His disciples had scattered and fled. <clears throat> here's the Roman soldiers rounded up the cross. Uh, here's the people of Israel jeering and mocking him, If thou be the Son of God, come down the cross, and we will worship you. Matthew 27, 42. Here's people that are spitting on him. Here we see the Lord covered in blood, sweat, and human spell. And in the very midst of all that, the Bible tells us there was a darkness over the entire earth. I mean, here's Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Here's the light of the world. Here's the one that Malachi chapter 4 calls the Son of Righteousness, and that's capital S-U-N, Malachi chapter 4. It's not only, it's not capital S-O-N, it's capital S-U-N. Here is the Son of Righteousness. S-U-N, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world, the one who is the very light of the world. And the world rejects him, the world spits on him, the world mocks him, and God reacts from heaven by bathing this world in darkness. Yes, sir. I have even read in the writings of the heathen Greeks 
who were hundreds of miles away, the heathen Greeks, who back in that day had no way of knowing what was going on in another part of the world. Those heathen Greeks who believed in a whole shelf of gods, they had a god of love, a god of war, you know, a god of this, a god of that. So did the Romans. <clears throat> here, <clears throat> here were the Greeks hundreds of miles away with no television, no radio, no communications like they have today. <clears throat> the Greeks, the heathen Greeks, who knew nothing about Christ, knew nothing about what was going on in Jerusalem, when this darkness prevailed over the earth, those heathen Greeks said, surely a god must have died. <clears throat> well, you're getting warm. <clears throat> getting mighty close. <clears throat> but it's not just the idea that a god has died. It's that the Son of God has been crucified hundreds of miles away in Jerusalem, and God reacted by sending darkness on this earth. Uh, that's justifying his son, showing his son uh, to be here, to be the, well, the one he claimed to be. But I want to move off of this right fast and talk to you about the greatest way in all the history of the world that God justified his son. It says he's manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Remember that term justified means to declare to be just. The greatest declaration of the divinity of Christ, the greatest approval God ever put on his work, we'll find in Romans chapter 1 verse 3. The Apostle Paul says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, what's this? And declared to be the Son of the Son of Righteousness with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. <laughs> Here's where God justified him in the Spirit. It says, in the resurrection, that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Here's where God justified everything he'd ever taught. And listen to me very carefully. According to the Bible, if God had not been satisfied, totally satisfied with everything Jesus Christ did on your behalf, if God had not been totally satisfied, Jesus Christ would have remained in the tomb. Let's go to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, verse 10. It says, yet it pleased him to bruise him. He had put him to grief. Watch this says, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. That when is an adverb. It points to the time when Christ died on the cross. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. The world says today that Christ offers himself to you, that Christ offers himself to all lost sinners. Christ offers himself to the world. Christ never offered himself but one time. And when Christ made that offering, he did not offer himself to me, to you, or to the world. Now, chapter Hebrews, verse 12, tells us uh, that neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, uh, he entered in once into the holy place. And it says that by the offering of himself, it says he offered himself without spot and without blemish to God. Jesus Christ never offered himself at one time, and when he made that offering, he made that offering to God his Father. He didn't make it to the world. He's not offered himself to you or to me or anybody else. He made that offering to God. It says, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, it says he shall see his seed. That says when he died on the cross, at the very time he offered himself for the sins of his people, God allowed him to see his seed, to see the fruit of his labor. He saw the fruit of his labor. And it says, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, it says uh, he shall see his seed, he shall see the travail of his soul, and be satisfied. Now just a minute. Uh, the world says that millions that Christ died for will be lost. Well, not just a minute. I, I've read pamphlets with, by that name. I have booklets people handed me by that name. What a shame it is they say that millions that Christ died for are, per are going to perish in hell. Well, according to this, when Christ died on the cross, he saw his seed. He saw the travail of his soul, and he's satisfied with it. Can you imagine an intelligent person setting out to do something? then ha having to settle for half of what they set out to do? Can you imagine Jesus Christ coming into this world trying to save all of Adam's race and yet he'll only save a third or a fourth and saying, I'm satisfied? Why, <clears throat> the only way that the Lord Jesus Christ would be satisfied is to save everyone he came into the world to save. And after all, that's what he said he did. In John 6, 37 through 39, he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. The prophet Isaiah said, <coughs> 
Uh, he had put him to grief. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. To bruise him. Uh, it says he had put him to grief. It said, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, said he shall see the travail of his soul, and says thou shalt prolong his days. <clears throat> that says God the Father would prolong his days. Well, how is it that the days of Christ were prolonged? If the Father had not been satisfied with everything Christ did, Christ would remain in the grave. That's right. yes. <clears throat> but he raised him from the dead and prolonged his days. He rose from the dead to never die anymore. Amen. To prolong his days. He was justified in the spirit when he rose from the dead. One more text on that. 1 Peter 3, 18. Mm -hmm. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Catch it? Quickened by the Spirit. You know how Christ came out of the grave? He is quickened by the Spirit. Now then, I'm going to make a comparison here. I've made to God's people hundreds of times. But I don't say this to be nasty and sarcastic. There's a lot of things out there. <clears throat> Men can preach things to you, and you'll think you've got it down, but it'll fly right over your head until you need it. I don't say this to be sarcastic whatsoever. Uh, my son has been hearing me preach from the time he's born. There came a time when he started introducing the services, you know, started pastoring churches, uh, went off to college, uh, had to deal with all kinds of people. And he's super intelligent. I'm not saying this to ridicule him, but there's time and time again he'd call me or he'd come home to see me. He'd start asking me about uh, how do you handle the Armenians on John 3.5. How would you answer them here? How would you answer them here? How would you answer them on that? I tell him, I say, well, I've been preaching on this all your life. <clears throat> it's not that he's not a good listener. It's not that he's not in intelligent. But when he's sitting out there like a lot of the rest of you, he just let it fly over his head. <clears throat> <clears throat> but now you get off to college, you get out here among other folks, and they start putting a hot brand and iron to your flesh. <clears throat> and I don't say this to be nasty. I could stand up here and call the names of prominent primitive Baptist preachers that have called me on the phone. One called me a few years back. He said, I've got to go talk to some people tonight about the sin against the Holy Ghost. said, I heard you one time give the only explanation I've ever heard that will fit. And he said, I don't recall what it was. Said, I heard you give it. But he said, I just let it fly over my head. Oh, uh, sure. I had another preacher call me, a well-known preacher. I love this brother. He said, I heard you one time go to the 10th chapter of Romans in a conversation and you gave the only answer to faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God that I ever heard that the Armenians cannot handle and he said I'm ashamed to tell you I'll let it fly right over my head <clears throat> these people don't let what I say or what preach other preachers say fly over their heads you don't let it fly over your head because you're ignorant <clears throat> you let it fly over your head because you don't need it and you say, oh, I've heard that before. Well, don't say, but don't ever say that to me. God's people better never come up and say to me about something I preached. I heard that before. You know what I'm going to say to you? Well, since you heard it before, explain it to me. <laughs> you say, well, I can't do that. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Visit the Primitive Baptist Digital Library for videos, articles, history, hymns, and encouragement. www.primitivebaptist.net